Okay, great. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the fir uh, FAST first in fir virtual information night session. Uh, my name is Billy Jo Falsgraf, and I am the communications director and new family liaison here at FAST. Um, tonight, our principal, Mr. Stan Biner, is going to share with you um, all the unique things about FAST, um, you know, what we, what we do here, who we are, um, and so he'll be giving you lots of information to help you get to know the school. After his presentation is over, we will have time to answer your questions. Uh, anytime during the presentation you have a question, please uh, enter it using the chat feature. And at the end, I will go ahead and read your questions to Mr. Biner. Um, and so with that, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Biner. Thank you very much. Um, Good evening, everybody. Thank you for your interest in FAST. Uh, my name is Stan Biner. I am the very proud uh, principal of Fulton Academy of Science and Technology. Uh, just a few words about myself. Uh, I have been in education for more years than you mentioned. However, I came to FAST actually wanting to teach. I had been an administrator almost all of my life. And I wanted to get back to what I originally had signed up to be, which was a teacher. And so I began working at FAST as a third grade teacher. I loved it. It was the hardest work I did, but I just loved everything about the vision of the school. It really matched up with my own personal philosophy about education. Um, I took a hiatus for a half a year where I was called out to help out with a school in Las Vegas. And when I came back, they rehired me to teach eighth grade science and social studies, at which point I was particularly thrilled and thought this is it for the rest of my life. I love teaching eighth grade. I love teaching science and social studies. However, as things would happen, um, there was an opening at the, uh, at the school for a principal and uh, at a certain point in time, I was pushed forward and uh, accepted uh, responsibility. I, I actually did apply and uh, became the principal of the school and, and it has been a wonderful experience. So this, um, this slideshow is gonna take you through a little bit about what the school stands for. And I am sure it's going to prompt some uh, questions that you can put in the chat. Uh, this is the first time we're doing it like this, so uh, if there are any glitches, we apologize in advance, but uh, we're ready to go. So I want to begin by just giving you um, a little bit of history of who we are. We are a charter school, and uh, we are currently in our fifth year of existence. We are through probably the biggest hurdle of renewing our charter. We will be going to the state in about a month very confident of the results uh, that will, will probably be taking place because um, probably the most important, um, first most important uh, group of people that we needed to impress were the people of Fulton County and uh, they recommended us for a full five year uh, renewal for, for uh, the coming year. Uh, the charter school was started by parents uh, who came together. Their Particular, they had been a part of a charter before, that charter had failed, and they really wanted to recreate um, the charter experience with a new vision, one that was based on um, a school that looks towards the future and prepares children um, in every way for what is to come. Um, our mission statement um, is a little bit lengthy as mission statements tend to be, but what we've done is we've highlighted some of the key words that I want to pull out. Uh, and so you see design thinking and problem solving. Uh, we are a STEM certified school. We just received that um, accolade a few months ago. Uh, and you see the word innovation and at the end, by the diverse, a diverse demographic. Um, our school, we have breaking, broken this big mission statement down into a few key statements that we live by. Um, and so we're gonna take you through and you will 
you will actually see as we talk through the talk through this uh, presentation that all of these words are going to come into play. Um, so, next slide. So the charter, the charter school was created based on the work of a woman named Susie Boss, who wrote a book called Bringing Innovation to School. Uh, the founders of the school were enamored by this presentation of education, the way education should be moving into the future. And actually at our first graduation, uh, she came to speak at the school and really spoke to a lot of the things that she hoped that every school would have and that she was seeing um, evidence at, our, at FAST. Uh, she took particular note of our capstone projects and some of the very creative and imaginative things that our graduating students had come up with as their culminating uh, projects. So these are the kinds of qualities that we're looking for and that we wanna foster in the students that come to our school. So as I mentioned, we break our mission statement down to a few building blocks. Building for the future, culture of innovation, child-focused, and many people's one community. And by, by build, putting it into a building block format, we can always remember those key points of our program, which we referred back to all the time in the decisions that we are making. So I want to start by talking about the diversity of our community it is built into our mission statement. And it's a very important part of who we are. The school is located in North Fulton. It is not a particularly diverse community, um, but a lot of people come to FAST for the STEM and the innovation and the creativity but people are also looking for a community that reflects the real world and where their children have the opportunity to uh, interact with people of different cultures. And as you can see from, uh, from these, these statistics in front of you, you can see that we have people, we have people from so many different cult cultures that form one community. We're also proud of the diversity of our, of our teaching staff, uh, which also, um, helps send the message to our children of what the, the world should look like. So how do we enforce the idea of many people's one community? One of the things that we have in our program, which is now common and standard in many, career, many schools, is social emotional learning. That we take time out of our week just to talk to the children about what's appropriate, being sensitive to other people, <clears throat> learning how to be comfortable in your own skin, and talking about the issues that come up in the, in the classroom as a microcosm that goes on in the larger world. And so we divide, it, we divide up our week into six days. So it's a six day cycle. And on three of those days, students will have an opportunity, a period of time where they will be doing social emotional learning. In addition to that, we offer a lot of different learning opportunities so that we can message to our children that so many different people contribute to our country's growth, to the, to the betterment of the world. So we celebrate something called Heritage Week, which we did online. Uh, this year, right before Thanksgiving, uh, in which we uh, experienced multiple cultures from around the world. S some of the things we did included uh, children dressing in their native costumes, children building um, historic landmarks from various countries, um, storytelling, and we gave a good picture and it ended on uh, with a assembly about Thanksgiving. And we talked about being a na nation of immigrants and what it meant to celebrate as one Thanksgiving brings everyone together. Uh, we did Hispanic Heritage Month earlier this year, and we had the opportunity of some of our Hispanic teachers to be able to share where they came from uh, and for students to be able to ask questions. 
up. Black History Month is coming up. Women's History Month. We're also adding this year Asian, Asian Pacific History Month because we do have a number of students from that part of the world. Uh, something else that we build into our curriculum is diversity training. Uh, we wanna make sure that our teachers are aware of the cultural sensitivities of many different people and making sure that everyone feels included. And we have to start by making sure that we know where we're coming from. And so we do this on a regular basis to make sure that our teachers are really teaching a worldwide curriculum for the kids to prepare the children for a shrinking, shrinking globe. Next slide. The next area that we focus on is being, being um, centered on children. That we want each child to be able to reach their greatest potential. One of the biggest things that we emphasize at our school is that children develop at different uh, paces. They, they don't all come out the same. And if we were to tag a child with a label of saying that they should be in this class because they're having trouble with math and they're not gonna be able to do this kind of material, that means we're basically defining for a child at five, six, seven years old, what they're gonna be capable of, capable of doing several years later. And so we try to avoid doing that at all costs. So we wanna focus on what children can do not on what they can't do and not to label them, but to see the potential in each child. Next slide. Oops. So some of the things that we do, ah, so is that the slide? Okay. So one of the things that we try to do is always stay focused on the learner, teaching the learner how to use his or her, her own voice, teaching them how to do self-assessment, uh, to be able to engage in their lessons fully. And we have a unique way of doing teacher observation. And this is a great example of what I'm talking about is that when we go in to observe a teacher, our focus is not on what the teacher is doing in front of the classroom or walking around. Our focus is on what the learners are doing. How engaged are they? How, how much work are they doing with each other? What's the, how much time do they have to converse, to share their, their, their thoughts and ideas? And by staying focused on the learner, the teacher also designs their lessons in a very specific way. We always have our learning goals up, our learning targets, a way for kids to be able to check themselves, for us to teach them how to do self-assessment. But this is a very important a part of our, our curriculum of how we focus and our teacher supports that. And we try to create an environment that's gonna support that. So in a normal non-COVID time, you will see in classrooms a multiple, a multiple choices in terms of furniture. There'll be tall desks and there'll be sofas and there'll be picnic tables. And we, the lighting is gonna be um, designed for the classroom so that you will see a, a, a school where the teachers pay particular attention to the environment in which the student learns because we have discovered and it's research-based that students learn best when the environment is taken, taken into consideration. Our next slide. So here are some of the ways that our, we embed this idea into our program. We have a genius hour. The Genius Hour is an opportunity for the children and, and it, it's scaffolded in terms of, of critical thinking skills. So at the beginning of um, our school curriculum in kindergarten and Genius Hour takes place once a week, a teacher might be spend some time talking to the children about how do we brainstorm, how do we share ideas? And they will come up with an idea to do a project of interest and maybe there'll be a group project because they're younger children. But as they get older, they'll move into pairs, into trios, and then finally to doing individual work on areas that they just find exciting, things that they're interested in. As a third grade teacher, I had a child do a presentation on henna painting, another one who, who studied up on urban legends. Um, somebody created a pinball machine. 
they, but it's things that the kids would like to learn about. But in doing so, we're fostering their creativity, teaching them how to do backwards thinking. This is your goal. How are you going to get there? And working always towards the idea of giving the child the empowerment and the skill to do things for themselves. It culminates with capstone. Capstones is the eighth grade program. And actually this picture, these are students that were in my class. I taught capstones. And this particular project, uh, the young man holding the drone, um, he built a drone that was synced with the camera that another student is wearing. And he, um, he was able to program that drone and took it to a farm and, and, and had the drone going in and out of bar barns and and put it to music. And um, it was just something that he had to start, every kid has to start with um, a plan of action, a proposal, you have to give a pitch, you give them, you bring in somebody to talk about public speaking. They, um, they have to put together a timeline, a website, and then it culminates at the end of the year is a major event, the Capstone Week, where students all get to present their, um, final product to the community. Um, innovation is another program that helps build towards Capstone, which is where we have two teachers whose only job is to work with the children in the area of innovation. And innovation is primarily focused on problem solving and on creating solutions, working together as teams. Uh, the sixth grade right now, I was actually in a Zoom observation of the teacher today, and they are creating what is the ideal school community and what goes into a building and community. And so they're all in little groups and breaking out in Zoom in uh, various um, breakout rooms to discuss their component of the project, but they work individually, they work in groups, and they work together to create solutions to problems. Fourth grades, project is primarily working with the environment and we have a new um, garden, a teaching garden that is going to be um, uh, introduced this, this spring. Um, and so they will be among the leaders of that project. Uh, this year, the school, our school has applied to be a no place to hate school. It's a program sponsored by the Anti-Defamation League. And uh, what we like about this program is that it's a committee made up of teachers and students, but it has to be student-led. It's another opportunity for students to sort of work on, on something that they care about, but in addition to that, uh, leadership. Our student council has a large number of students involved. They actually, even though we've been online, uh, they ran a very successful uh, drive for a uh, shelter that we recently um, had pick, uh, materials and items picked up uh, for that. And the student council is always active in, um, in planning activities and social action events. Um, and it's a very exciting part of the, the school. A lot of kids get involved. We also have Study Island, which is connected to our standardized testing program, which is MAP. And what happens is when students take their standardized test, MAP will create an algorithm which can be used by Study Island, which allows our teachers to target individuals for um, enrichment, for, um, for support, uh, and students can follow their own path, which is designed for them, um, with a program that's been individually designed based on their scoring. <clears throat> and so, our, less, our classes will also, you'll see when you go into the classes, um, evidence of child-centered learning, students working in groups, students working in um, clusters, and the teacher will often be going from group to group to, to monitor how they're doing. So this is how we help children um, reach their potential. We're also teaching to the whole child. So we have art, we have music, computer science, health, PE, these are our specials. In addition, we have after school clubs. And this year we have um, now joined the Fulton County School Middle, um, Middle School League. Um, 
Unfortunately, there's not been a lot of sports this year, but the Rocketeers will be playing basketball um, in uh, after after winter break. So we are excited to be adding this as a new component to the school. So we also recognize that our students are going to be coming with a different uh, at different intellectual levels, different creative levels, different things that they're going to need for themselves. So we do have a full TAG program. Our TAG program uh, goes K-8. Uh, we have probably, at any given time, about 40% of our students do qualify. Uh, what's unique about our TAG program is that, unlike most schools, um, we do not pull our children out of TAG for a day. Most schools will pull the kids out for a day, leaving other students in the classroom. Um, we instead embed our TAG program in our science program. So all of our science teachers are TAG trained uh, so that they can provide the TAG skills along with the a level of instruction that TAG students are, are looking for. Uh, in middle school, uh, we, we add social studies as a second TAG classroom. Um, and we do a lot of testing, goes on every year. Uh, students, as I said, students develop at their own pace. And so we will have students that enter the TAG program in sixth grade or seventh grade. Uh, but the program is a important part of our school, but I will say something which speaks to who we are. One of the other reasons why we have TAG done in the way we, we do is to make sure that these students feel grounded and that there isn't an elitism that goes along with a TAG program. Uh, they're not better than other children. They, they have needs that are going to be serviced by TAG. So they have their science program and then they have their, their classes. But the message to other children is everybody is together for almost all of the day and everyone is getting the same kinds of activities. Uh, there's a separation for tag, but the message is one of equity, that we are trying to provide an outstanding program for every one of our children. So as we talk about innovation, uh, we are trying to create classrooms of the future, classrooms where innovation, creativity, critical thinking are all part of the everyday experience. And so the way we do that is we don't just talk about it, but we embed it into our curriculum and we embed it into the day-to-day -day operation of the school. And so we have a variety of different programs that speaks to this. We do Singapore math, which I'll talk about in a minute, and FOSS science. And FOSS is science is taught every day starting in kindergarten. It's a five day a week program from the time the children get into the school, as opposed to having science for two weeks and social studies for two weeks. Uh, we teach social studies, but science is an important component of our program. In middle school, starting in sixth grade, Students have a five day a week coding program. It is considered a core program at our school. It's a core class. And so students can't be pulled out of coding for other uh, services they might be getting. Um, in seventh and eighth grade, they are eligible for high school credit if they meet the criteria. We have one-to-one -one technology. Every child has their own device. And as we mentioned before, we have genius hour, flexible seating, academic teams, which we'll touch base on later. So we're going to talk about curriculum right now. So um, Singapore math is not a math program that is typically found in the public schools. Uh, there are a number of private schools uh, that do um, engage Singapore math for several reasons. The first one is that Singapore math is designed to teach children how to problem solve and how to look at solving problems in different ways, that there's no one way to come up with a solution and that they want to make sure that they teach children how to 
think abstractly. We always get the concrete, you know, that memorizing the times tables, which I can tell you as a teacher, you have to memorize your, your times tables, but that's concrete. But then how do you visualize? Some people are visual learners. So using the bar graphs, which you see at the bottom of the page, these bar models are very important part of the curriculum. We have manipulative that the kids use. So there's hands-on touching, developing that strong number sense. And then there's the abstract thinking of when you have to do your mental math. Uh, next slide continues a little bit more of an uh, explanation. These are what we're trying to do. And sometimes a problem might be a simpler problem and it's purposeful. The reason why it's, more, it's, it's simpler is because Singapore math is not interested in the kid getting the answer. They're interested in seeing if the kids can find different ways to solve the same problem. So the purpose is multi-level and it really does have an impact on students' scores and the way students think. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how it, impacts, how it impacts the overall learning experience a little bit later. We also use a program called FOSS Science. And these are examples of some of the kits. Um, it is a, a program that is focused on being uh, hands-on, um, lots of experiments, uh, the, from day one, kids are digging in and learning how to, um, to explore science on a variety of levels, but really lots of experiments. Uh, by third grade, they know how to do a lab book uh, and they know how to write up their labs because when they leave in eighth grade, we want them to know exactly how to, to do that. That's important just in preparation for a high school. But it also, when you, when you pay attention to that, you teach students how to focus on the important details that you can't skip when you're doing problems and when you're learning, when you're recording, when you're logging. So it really does give students a more comprehensive uh, view of science. And science is almost always a favorite class that we give. As mentioned also, we do participate. We're a, uh, a, a full service school. Um, we have the Science Olympiad, Math Olympiad, Math Count, Spelling Bee. We just finished Spelling Bee. We had 28 rounds um, before we could finally crown a winner um, in this year's Spelling Bee. And they'll now go on to Fulton County for uh, the next step. Um, and we usually have a Geography Bee. Sadly, this year, some of the things we've had to pull a hold due to the pandemic, but they are embedded in our program. So, and again, you're going to see some things that are that we've already mentioned before. And the reason why we continue to put it up is that we are, are looking at projects, the activities we do, not just to build creative thinkers, but to teach kids how to take leadership responsibilities on, how to focus on their assessment. So these programs that we have have multiple purposes. And so, as you mentioned, as we're trying to create a group of leaders for, uh, for the rapidly changing world, we want our children to leave here and feel that they can make a difference, which is why we have so many different ways in which they can do so. Um, and things that we haven't mentioned, we do field studies to, that are purposeful and connected to the curriculum. When the kids get to middle school, they'll go on trips um, outside Atlanta. Uh, the eighth graders go to Savannah, where they're, which kind of culminates their um, science and their social studies. Um, activities because they do um, Georgia studies in eighth grade um, and they and then we also have in seventh grade they usually do some kind of community building um, environmental program so each grade has its own program 
um, for the kids to be able to get away and learn outside the classroom. Um, next slide. Uh, one of the things that we have to do is have really good teachers. And so our teachers are, um, are, are certified um, or they are in, the, or they're in a, um, a program in which they're being monitored to become certified, but nobody can be in the program without being in a, um, a they have to all have certificates to be teaching. Um, we have a lot of hands-on learning as we've talked about before and interdisciplinary units, the teachers will work together to, uh, to create programs that might include math and social studies and science um, at the same time. But in order to do this, we have to continually be training our teachers. So we have professional development every week. This past week, we were talking about executive functioning skills and particularly critical in this remote learning environment. Uh, we fund teachers to go to conferences. We also have professional learning communities that meet monthly. Um, and we talk, we do um, mentoring on classroom design. But all of these things are intended to continue to have our teachers learning and pushing them to move forward. We fund, um, we fund our teachers um, if they have not yet received the TAG certification, we pay for that because we consider that a priority. Because we can't run our program unless we have very skilled and very skilled teachers and teachers that are, are participating in ongoing learning. Next slide. So what happens when students embrace design thinking? So this is one of those you can read while I'm talking. But design thinking takes into, into account the fact that our curriculum has a, a purpose that goes beyond content. It's about making our children capable, developing a sense of self and a confidence that they can do things and that they are capable of taking on challenges and not afraid of it. We talk a lot about how failure is part of the learning experience and that that's how you learn. You know, uh, we often use the example of a baseball player. If you're batting 333, you are considered a great hitter. But that also means that you're striking out or getting out two out of three times. So it's a matter of understanding that it's about continuing to apply yourself. The design thinking also has an impact on the overall growth of a child. So as part of our renewal process, we were asked the question, do you have data that tells you that design thinking actually has an impact on the learning process? And so what we did was we, we separated out uh, students who had started at the school and had been to school uh, you know, since either kindergarten or first grade or second grade. And then we took the scores that our, we took the scores that our children um, achieved on the MAP scores and compared them with students that are just coming into the school. And the differential is pretty noteworthy. Now, does that mean that they're smarter than the kids coming into the school? No. But what we also discovered is that the students that we were matching them up with, as we follow them to the upper grade, they too begin to become part of that core group that they, the impact of this way of thinking, the creativity, expanding the mind, it has an impact on learning. And when students come in, and please keep in mind, we have kids coming in um, in third, fourth, fifth grade, sixth grade, um, and kids are coming at different times. It does not take them long to begin to uh, meld in with the fast mindset. One, because they like it, our teachers are engaged, but two, because it's a really interesting place to be and it's a fun place to be. And I'm not gonna discount fun as a motivation for learning. So let's go on to our next slide. Um, so experiential education, uh, again, just talking about the fact that people learn best by doing. 
and we try as hard as we can to give as many opportunities as possible to make sure that children are fully engaged in the learning process. Uh, Project-based learning is something that's embedded. You hear that uh, talked about often, but the idea behind project-based learning is that, that we pick something, we do this a lot in innovation, that by choosing a project, we then within that we bring in math, science, social studies, all kinds of things there. It's a longer project. It takes place over two or three months, but in doing so, it brings in all of the disciplines. And so students are not being segmented. If, oh, this is math, so we do math. This is science, so we do science. But no, the idea is to be able to create opportunities to make sure that all the disciplines are connecting with each other, like in the real world. Next. So our fast schedule, so how do we do it? Well, it's a longer day. Uh, we start at 7.40, we end at 3.00. Um, on Thursdays, we, we stop at 2.20 in order for our teachers to have staff development. We do offer aftercare from 3.45 to 6.30. And during aftercare, children will be helped with their homework. Uh, children will also have the opportunity to participate in after-school clubs. Anyone can participate in an after-school club. They don't have to be in aftercare. In terms of our school schedule, um, we try to mirror Fulton County as best we can because a lot of our students have older siblings in high school um, or siblings that they have in other schools. And we wanna make sure it's convenient for parents. But there are times where we might deviate. For instance, in March, uh, we have a mini spring break and we have a staff development day on days that Fulton County does not have, have a staff, have a or is having classes. Um, we're starting a day earlier after, uh, after uh, winter break for our students and also for our teachers. But we will always end when Fulton County ends and we will always start when Fulton County ends, Fulton County starts. So as we mentioned before, we have aftercare and after school clubs they include Spanish and writing and musical theater, hip hop, um, all kinds of things uh, to keep the fun going after school. Um, we also have a dress code. Uh, we have a dress code for a variety of reasons. Now, one of the most important reasons is that we can focus on learning and not on how we are dressing. There's also a equity issue in that not everybody is coming from uh, a, a well-to-do background. We have a diversity in socioeconomic levels in our school. And when all, everybody is wearing the same thing, there is a de-emphasis on the haves and have-nots for whatever that means. But we're really focused on making sure that children feel that they're just as special and just as good as the person next to them. We also want them to be comfortable physically and emotionally, and wearing a uniform takes away a lot of the issues. And when your children get er early, get older, it's a lot less time having to get them ready in the morning when they can only pick between three different colored shirts that all look the same. Trust me, as a father of three daughters, I loved uniforms myself. But the focus is on learning and there is a reason why we do have a uniform. For people who are of limited means, we have a gently used sale, which most people shop at. You can get shirts for $2 or $3, and the PTO will all support families who, um, who really need full support, but nobody is going to have a problem with uniforms. We will make sure that that is always something we take into consideration. Okay, getting to and from fast. We do have limited bus service. Um, right now we have buses that, um, that pick up and drop off at Brandon Square, which is not far from the school, 
But a lot of people don't want to deal with carpool. So if they drop them off at Brandon Square, they're in and out in five minutes and they don't have to worry about it. We also have a bus that comes from um, Scott, what's it called? Oh, I'm missing, what's the name of it, Billy Joe? Sky Zone. Sky Zone. And so we have a lot of people on that bus. We did have another bus that was going to come from um, North Point Church, uh, but uh, due to the craziness of this year, we are, are going to be limiting ourselves to two buses. Uh, we do offer shuttle service uh, from South Fulton um, uh, that is independently run, but is available. And there are other shuttle services uh, that parents sometimes contract for, and we provide them for we provide them space so that they can get in and out conveniently. Uh, carpool is carpool is carpool. Uh, we have a very well organized system. We use a computerized a system that gets people in, in and out as quickly as possible. Once things are running smoothly, carpool starts at three twenty. Usually by 345 or 350, we're done. Um, but as a hint for those of you that are, oh, I'm all in, just get me through the lottery. If you show up at 340, it's just a drive in. So, and we'll still watch your children. Good job. So, this is probably the most important slide on this, of this presentation. And it's making sure that you make the right choice for your child. And the fact that you are online right now trying to learn more about the school is an important step in doing that. Now, as I mentioned, I've talked about our TAG program, but we have we have special service department that addresses, helps out with children with IEPs and 504 plans. We provide ESOL services, RTI, it's early intervention. We have all of those services. And, but it's important for you as parents to recognize that, you know, our school's program is robust, but we do not have the resources of a large public school. Um, we really have never actually had a self-contained classroom because we don't have enough students for a self-contained classroom. So we typically would modify a IEP for a parent if they're willing to do so um, in order for their child to have the uh, services they need. But it is important for you to know at you know what the level and capacity of your child is at this moment in time to make sure that when the child comes to, to the school, they're gonna get the most out of it. But we service children with all kinds uh, of different needs um, and, and so that should not be a concern of yours. However, please understand that when you come to the school, there's other things you have to keep in mind because you may love the school as a parent, but we are a noisy school. We are really noisy. We talk all the time. We, now, most of the time it's productive talk, but sometimes it's not, but it's a noisy place. Uh, some of our rooms don't have ceilings in the innovation hall. Now we have managed that well, but noise is a, is a factor in our school because we want our kids to talk. So if a child needs a really structured program, if they have sensory issues, you have to consider whether your child is going to be a good choice, the school's gonna be a good choice for your child Maybe it's a great school, but maybe you need to wait a year or two in order to make sure that your child gets the most out of fast. Uh, and sometimes for people, the longer day, it's too long for your child. Um, and of course the kids aren't just sitting in their classroom seats the whole day, but it is a longer day. So, but, but again, I wanna reemphasize, I'm not trying to scare people away, but, as a parent of children that have had different needs and, 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 and different learning styles, I understand that choosing the right school for each child is, is something I have to do on an individual basis. And you know, you do the best you can, but um, as I said to you before, we, have, we do support ongoing services. 
if you're considering a transfer and you have services here at school, we will work on a smooth, um, a smooth transition. We have three case managers that work with their school. We have an interventionist. So uh, we have the staff to support children. So I do not want to give the wrong impression, but keep in mind sensory, keep in mind noise, keep in mind how structured a child is. Does a child need structure, structure, structure? It might be a little hard because we, we have a different schedule each day. In some, not everything, but they may be doing different things every day. But on the other side of it, it's an extremely exciting and it's a very stimulating environment, which is why we have so many people that want to come to our school. So a few details um, about the lottery. So we are, as a charter school, uh, we have a lottery that we abide by very seriously. Uh, we, it's important that you follow the deadlines. We open on January 1st. Um, do not wait up until 12.01 sending your lottery because there is no first come first serve. Uh, sometime during that month between January 1st and February 3rd, you need to have your lottery in. It doesn't mean that after the lottery is over that you can't apply, but you will be on the waiting list. Now waiting lists do move, um, but you know it's really important to be in that first wave because you will have a better chance of getting into the school. Uh, a lot of people like to know about how many spaces do you have open. So in kindergarten, we expanded our, um, our we expanded the program by a section last year. So we're able to take um, about 25 more kids than we had in the past. Uh, and we are expanding our first grade. Now, a lot of those children will be moving up, but we do have three sections there. And uh, we will be having three sections of second grade uh, this coming year as we, um, as we are building uh, from the bottom up. Um, sixth grade is a very big year for people coming in and we expand the number of students we accept in sixth grade um, significantly, uh, but that is probably kindergarten and sixth grade are the two grades where we get the most, um, most applications. Uh, in addition to that, we will have um, in-school tours uh, towards the end of January, we'll still, because I know people are gonna wanna come in and see the school, we are going to also have virtual tours where you can walk through the school um, online uh, with one of our staff people. Uh, but um, that's on the point. Billy Joe will be updating the uh, website on a regular basis. Uh, I believe next week, our video, uh, towards the end of this week, the video will be up, the comprehensive video, Billy Joe. Is that correct? Yes. Yep. By Friday. Okay. So, so by Friday, we're gonna have a very comprehensive video. And for those of you that have friends that might be interested, we really wanna encourage everyone to watch the video even before they come to the Q&A. Um, because sometimes people sign up for the school without having gone through one of these presentations and, you know, and they really don't know who we are when they sign up for it. So it's important that you, um, you have the opportunity to learn about our school. It's a very different program. It's a very exciting program. And the um, reason I think we're successful is because of the approach that we take. Uh, we have received our accreditation. We were recommended for the full five years, our STEM certification. Um, there's a lot of accolades that are coming towards the school, but we work hard every day uh, to continue to improve and make changes this year, for example, we add Spanish. So students in seventh and eighth grade will be able to take Spanish, but we're continually adding to our programs. Um, so uh, again, and this is the mantra we teach our kids, that they're focused, appreciative, self-disciplined, and thoughtful. And we come back to these, um, we come back to these um, attributes often. 
Uh, we have a program called the house program where children starting in third grade are broken up into different houses, uh, civility, leadership, uh, creativity, and the students have house leaders and house advisors. Uh, they compete against each other in activities and games and uh, develop a sense of community um, in smaller groups. Uh, so we're always having, um, even online, we're doing, we have competitions for this week. It's been um, kids taking pictures of themselves decorated in various holiday lights so they could earn points for their house. So, uh, but it's another fun way uh, to bring the school together as a community. So we are fast. Um, as I said, it's, uh, it's an exciting place to be as a teacher. I think it's a great place to be as a child. Um, and I think a lot of our parents feel that way too because uh, our we have a large waiting list. We have a lot of people that apply to the school. It's all word of mouth. It's all word of mouth. We'd like to think Facebook can help a little bit, but really it comes down to it. People are pretty much saying, I found out about from a friend of mine or a neighbor. And that's the best advertisement we can have. So that's that's our pitch. Um, and we have given you a lot of information. Um, sorry, I can't be looking at everybody's faces to see people's yes. reaction. But mostly I see black screen on <laughs> dark screen. But we're gonna open it up now for questions, Billy Joe. Yes, uh, we have uh, some questions. Uh, okay. The first question is, my son will be going into fourth grade. Do you find that children have difficulty adapting to the curriculum? For example, Singapore math begins teaching multiplication and division in second grade versus the public school, which starts in this in third grade. Right, so we are recognize that and it takes a little bit of time for the students to adjust to the system. It, takes about a month or so there are because there are areas where our students will as they get older they could be a year ahead now it doesn't mean that they're, they're that advanced but the materials in the way Singapore math um, cycles through the curriculum uh, they are trying to integrate geometry and and all the various operations from an early time on um, and continue to come back to it but what we have discovered <coughs> is that um, students, if you know, if we do some pullout with them, some kids adapt immediately because they've been waiting for this, um, or, and other kids it takes them a little bit of time. But very seldom we've had any child that isn't able to acclimate to the program. One of the things we did have in place this year, but weren't able to act on it, unfortunately, because of having to go virtual, is that we did have a new student orientation, but we weren't able to have the kids. Uh, we weren't able to have kids online uh, in person, but we were going to do an assessment and then be able to pull kids out. We saw that there were some areas that needed some targeted work on that will be in the program for next year. So children from third through seventh grade, when they come in for their new student orientation, we'll do an evaluation so the teacher can help the kids to assess, help the kids to um, fill in those gaps. Uh, but it's it's a very temporary thing. Okay, uh, a parent would like to know how you plan to address COVID next year. Well, it's a constantly evolving situation. Um, we do have a school nurse. She's very actively involved. We talk every day. Um, our school does require masks at this time. I don't know what the I don't know what the fall is going to. Um, bring us, uh, but uh, the safety components are all in place. We have um, the uh, no-touch hand sanitizers for the classrooms. Uh, we do have a, a large number of uh, dividers for the students uh, that we have on hand. Um, we, have, we, do try to, we are trying to do social distancing at this particular point. Um, so I think for us, we have been practicing a very conservative approach towards COVID this year. And uh, we have had our teachers at school uh, from the start of the year uh, with virtually 
no one, no, no, like we have one assistant teacher come down with the virus and the other person was my assistant, but not, uh, but we, we are really careful in monitoring and keeping people at home if they, uh, they're exhibiting symptoms. Uh, we do, we'll, we, at this time, we are planning to be taking temperatures of kids when they come in the building. Um, but one of the things that I've learned about education is plan for everything and, and throw, it, throw that plan out when, it's, when things change and come up with another plan. Um, you have to be flexible with it, but uh, for us, it's a really important thing. And one of the reasons why we're just coming back to school in January is our concern for the health of our children. Uh, but at this particular point, uh, we feel that we have the protocols in place to be able to manage this. Uh, next question, how do children with IEPs, for example, high functioning ASD or under OHI fare at the school? It really is, it can depend on the child. I think uh, if a parent is, has questions about it, um, conversation with their special services director. We have a person whose only job is to uh, support our, our case managers. Um, but it really is, a, you know, we can look in the IEP. We can, I mean, we, we, we are obligated to provide support and services. There are times where if a child had adaptive PE and we don't have adaptive PE, we might have to provide service to another school to be able to provide that. That, that hasn't really panned out. Um, so I think in terms of that, that's an individual thing, but I think it's it would be proactive for a person who has some concerns to be able to ask further questions. Uh, we are happy to answer every question. Um, obviously as a public school, we're obligated to take um, children that apply their Fulton County School. Uh, but I think you are asking as a parent to make sure that it's going to be a good fit. Even if you want the school, you want to make sure that the school is able to meet its obligations. Uh, we have about 50 children in our have IEPs. It's a very typical percentage, of about 12% of our school, which is pretty much the national norm um, that, uh, that have IEPs that we service. Uh, what are the typical classroom sizes? So, um, <clears throat> Typical size is but 24. Uh, that's the max we can have in the class um, because we are a pretty full school. Uh, you know, we'll usually start our classes with 24. In kindergarten, uh, there's a power in each classroom. So the the, the uh, ratio is 12 to 1. Um, we have power, we will also have a para that is in uh, first grade that is shared by, the two, by currently two classes. Uh, but in terms of for the, for the rest of the program, I apologize. I have a deeper that keeps going off and I've got to turn it off. Um, but generally speaking, uh, it is 24. Okay. Um, are there any specific criteria for the admission process? Absolutely none. Um, again, because we are a public school, we accept children who are Fulton County residents. So if you live in Fulton County, we're not, so this is from really important, we're not a state charter. A state charter, somebody can come from any county to our school. We are not, we are a Fulton County charter, which means you do have to prove residence when you um, come to the school uh, that you are living in Fulton County. Okay. Uh, with the longer day, are kids getting adequate outdoor slash recess time? Yes, our school does believe in recess. Uh, so uh, stu every student, <clears throat> they have one structured recess that is uh, usually around, backed up to lunch of about uh, 30 minutes. Uh, and then there's usually another, in the elementary school, there's usually a, there is a second recess break uh, that's built in, uh, but they tend to be what we call more organic. Uh, but your, our expectation is students have a minimum of two breaks during the day plus lunch uh, so that they can take their brain, give their brains a break. Um, in, uh, in middle school, we have recess uh, that is a 
attached to lunch. So they have a half hour for recess and a half hour for lunch. How many total seats are available for kindergarten? That would be approximately 772. <laughs> okay. To what extent can curriculums be individualized? Um, to some extent, in terms of if a child is in need of enrichment, um, teachers have enrichment activities in the classroom to be able to extend the learning. It's one of the reasons we mentioned Study Island. If a child needs intervention, that would primarily be a pullout. It really depends on the level. I mean, it's a general question. Uh, the person wants to give a little bit more clarity to their question, put it in the chat so we can I could answer it better, uh, but uh, we try to do a lot of work in groups and pods uh, so the kids can um, have free choice boards and things like that. So students aren't, we're not, it's not a frontal learning experience. And the teacher will provide them with a presentation of what they're due, and then they break up and start working in groups. Um, and so, it's, uh, there's, there's a lot of individualization in that way, which children have a lot of participation in the learning process. Uh, it's, but it's not a program where each child has their own separate individualized uh, program designed for them. Okay. Is there a literature curriculum that we use? Yes. Uh, we use uh, uh, Harcourt Brace's Journeys as our foundation. We also use several other supplemental uh, programs. We have a phonics program. Uh, we have a handwriting program. We do teach cursive in third grade uh, as well. So yes, but we do have a, a uh, the journeys program goes through sixth grade and in not, and seventh and eighth grade it is novel based. What is our specials rotation? For example, how often do students go to art or music? So the, our rotation in depends on the our rotation in elementary school is um, they have art, music, um, computer science, health, and PE. PE. Thank you. So they have a different special every day. Health is does it doesn't it sounds like oh it's uh, that that's going to be boring it's not boring it's a lot of fun actually we have a great teacher teaching it but uh like for instance in kindergarten the health teacher she'll probably do a might do a 10 or 15 minute lesson and then take the kids out to play or do games with them she uh she also will part of part of health is some additional pe uh in middle school uh, if the children are not taking Spanish in seventh to eighth grade, they would be rotating be, uh, by quarters with PE, PE, art, and music. And then there is, I believe that if they don't take Spanish, they do have a study hall, which is very popular. Okay. Uh, do you typically have space for new students in all grades or just kindergarten, first, and sixth? Uh, no, we generally st take students primarily in K through six, okay, depending on space in seventh grade, we'll sometimes take seventh graders. It's rare to take an eighth grader, but we do take applications for it uh, because we don't know what our numbers will be from each year. Um, and so we do have the lottery open and it's certainly worth uh, So, But you know, to, be per to be honest with you, um, eighth grade is not a great year to transition to middle school for a year before high school, uh, unless there's some unique situation. So primarily it's going to be K through six, but we do take some seventh graders. Okay, that's um, that's all the questions that we have. Um, you want to open up the uh, we don't, well we've been on for an hour. I don't know if you want if you want to have people just uh, ask questions using their voices, but. I think anybody, um, if they have any any more questions, to put it in the Zoom chat. Um, 
I just want to impress upon everyone um, the importance of filling out an application for the lottery uh, between January 1st at noon and February 3rd at noon if you're at all interested in the school. Um, pay, please periodically check our website, fastk8.org, for updates. And if you have questions beyond today or tonight's presentation, you can email them to info at fastk8.org. Um, one more question just popped up, Mr. Biner. Um, is there a waiting list that gets built up in case um, the name doesn't come up in the lottery in the first place? Yes, because you get onto a waiting list does not mean you won't get into the school. And actually we'll take children from the waiting list up through the 10th day of school being open. As at that point, we do have to close the waiting, the, the waiting list down um, and we had just said, but we do accept children and uh, we will see an influx of um, opportunity as children get very close to the start of school year. You have, we may have set your time, you know, think, oh, I didn't get into fast. And then you're going to get a, an email that says your child has been accepted and you have 24 hours or 48 hours to accept and indicate your level of interest. Uh, and that's because people often make changes or decisions or move um, as they're getting closer to the school year when they come back from vacations. And so we do find that we are we're taking students off the waiting list um, throughout the summer. It picks up at the end of the summer um, and then we'll take students it's, it's through till 10th day that the school is open. Okay, uh, one last question just popped up. I think it's an important one you'd want to answer. Um, do siblings get accepted together? Well, Billy Joe, that's a, that's a, it not, they do not. <laughs> um, they, do, they do not because it's a blind, it is a blind lottery. However, if your child gets into the school the following year, a child, so the siblings get priority. So that if you're not patient, because it can be difficult, but there are a lot of parents who will take that space knowing that the following year that their other kids are going to be able to come to the school. Uh, a lot of times siblings do get in. I mean, it's really the luck of the draw and the grades that they're applying to, um, but I would not discourage anybody from applying for both students because uh, we've, seen we've seen plenty of times where both kids get in. Okay, um, so I think that's all the questions. Uh, the recording of tonight's session will be available online um, on the website. Um, so you'll be able to refer to it uh, later. We may have another virtual night session in the future um, similar to this, but until that time, we'll keep this recording available to all the participants. Uh, then somebody did ask a question we take students mid-year and we oh, do I not. I answered them privately. <laughs> oh, you did. I just answered it publicly. Anyways, <laughs> but yeah. Anyways, please, if you have questions, let us know. Uh, we can direct you to the right person, but we definitely want to be open to, to everything you have, everything you need to know about FAST. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for taking um time out of your busy schedule to join us tonight to hear all about FAST and who we are and, and what we can offer your students. Um, like I said, the lottery opens on January 1st. So if you're at all considering it, it will take just a few minutes to click on that link to fill out an application. Um, and you really lose, lose nothing other than those few minutes it takes to fill out the application. The link will not be on the website until January 1st. So just be patient, it will pop up um, and that uh, for you to fill it out at that time. Okay. And happy holidays. Yes, happy holidays. Happy holidays. Thank you, everyone. Okay, bye, everybody.